Welcome back. We are live once again with the champ, Hannah Rankin, Boxed Off Forum. I'm your host, Terry L. This is part two because part one didn't end so well. <laughs> so uh, Hannah's been so gracious enough to give us part two as an interview. I know you're pretty busy. I want to get right into it. First of all, Hannah, how you been? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, really good. Bit busy, but uh, got back getting a sweat on today and in training, and I was happy to be punching things again. You know, I've, I've missed it. <laughs> um, uh, last time we spoke, you were getting ready to go to Glasgow for some commentating. How did that go? Went really well. I actually was up in Aberdeen. Uh, it's a fight zone. Was I took the card up there. My good friend Dean Sutherland was headlining. So um, yeah, it was fantastic to be doing the comms with Dominic McGuinness and uh, Glenn McCrory for Fight Zone and. Uh, we get on really well. We're a good team, and it, I'm quite enjoying learning off them. You know, they're they're really experienced in their job, and it's so it's so nice to actually have their support and get their backing to help me learn how learn the ropes as it is with the yeah with the comms. What's it like working with Glenn McCrory? Because he's a British legend, isn't he? So um, former yeah. middleweight middleweight champion, wasn't he? Cruiserweight. Oh, it's cruiserweight. Okay, and what's it like working with someone like him? Because I've I've listened to him quite a few times when he was with Sky Sports a while ago. Yeah, uh, but it, and um, I didn't realize he had changed to a fight zone. Yeah, no. So he's with Fight Zone, and it's fascinating working with someone like that. You know, he's he's got so much experience under his belt from his from like being a professional himself, and also he's he's a very fair and honest commentator. You know, he says it exactly as he sees it. He's not biased in any way, yeah. um, and that's really refreshing. I think, particularly at, at the moment in commentary, you know that you, there's no biased behavior from Glenn. He's just very honest, and exactly like he tell you if you were in the gym and he was watching you on the bag or something like that. You know, he yeah. gives you exactly very truthfully how it should be and how are you enjoying your commentating hat i'm really enjoying it it's not something that i ever planned to be doing or uh, thought i was going to be doing but um right. yeah no it's it's actually really interesting i love doing the research before on the fighters and um you know i think it's kind of nice for people to get like a fighter's view on it as well like a current fighter um, so I've been getting some really nice positive messages and I'm glad I've not put my foot in it or done anything stupid or <laughs> I managed to withhold any swearing, even when it's like really good mates. So yeah, no, I'm enjoying it. It's just a different no. thing. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, so oh, I managed so. to stop myself from doing that and, you know, I'm kind of getting, getting into it and it's definitely something that I would love to do when I retire from fighting, you know, it's a, a field that I'd be really interested in. Well, I'm quite sure you would have a, a future in commentating because one thing I do know about commentating, uh, there aren't very many, I don't know of any besides the odd guest appearance from Clarissa Shields or any sort of fighter like that. There aren't any female sports commentators. They're all male. It's a very male dominated uh, environment. Yeah, so the, it definitely still is, but there are some women coming on board. Like there's been some really good commentary from, um, few of the um my american friends obviously clarissa like you said and alicia napoleon she's really good as well okay yeah. and um michaela may has been doing a lot for top rank um right. and she's she's really good and uh cns estrada uh she's also a very good commentator she was doing that for um uh, let me get this correct uh can't remember what it's called uh something city ring city uh boxing or something like that but it was uh, over in america and it was it was really good really really good well on these shores i don't know of any no not really yeah. i mean tash jones, tash jones has got she's doing some now for sky um and she's she's a natural you know she's just so easy going in front of the camera and she suits the job really well so yeah she's she's doing well at that as well well awesome well we look forward to that day well obviously you gotta knock a few more heads off before yeah. you retire but then yeah. you know once you've done that, you can uh, move on. Now, last time we spoke, we spoke about your desire to fight on and defend this belt you just won, the WBA strap, strap as well as the IBO. Now, being a two belt strap holder, and this is bona fide now, you're not even, you know, the sil WB silver belt. Last time we had an interview a number of years ago, you were the WBC silver belt holder, which sounds great, but you want the real deal. Yeah. Now you have one of the major four belts. How does that really feel? It must have set in now. It's been two weeks now since you won the belt. What's it feel? What's it feel like? Uh, it feels amazing, obviously, to be a world champion and to actually have achieved what myself and Noel set out to do. You know, um, when I lost my world title in 2020, um, I yeah was absolutely gutted. Uh, 2019 actually, 2019. So I was ab absolutely gutted about it because we worked so hard to get to that point. You know, so it's been a long, hard 
uh, like road to get back to this position now, but we achieved our goal on the 5th of November and I'm really happy about that. So yeah, onwards and upwards and uh, it's an exciting time right now. So well, you're in the gym now, but there isn't any planned scheduled fight for the 2022. Are you, what's the deal? Is it going to be like a, um, a mandatory defense or are you going to go right in for some a big money fight? Um, so uh, obviously I'm leaving that up to Dennis Hobson and Fight Zone and, and Noel and Sam. Uh, they're going to be sorting that out for me. But I think the goal is to get me out to do a, a defense of my titles in, around about March, April time. And hopefully, fingers crossed, at home in Scotland in front of a home crowd because that would just be absolutely brilliant for me. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of the goal. I'm hope, hoping to be out March, April time next year. I mean, yeah, let's hope that happens. And this time, I got to be ringside. Don't forget me. I got to be there. I got to get that you press You better come. Come to Scotland. You'll yeah, no it. doubt. I think they got time for the brothers. Because, you know, I'm going to come out there and show them some DC love out there. Absolutely. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I'm going to be doing some ringside press interviews with my girl once she defends that belt. Yeah. Now, moving along, last time we spoke, you did say to me that you had a desire to fight a certain Canadian who may oh, yeah. be getting that strap. Is that still something in the pipeline? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, having got the, the WBA and the IBO, I'm, I'm obviously looking at the other belts in the division. Um, I think uh, Decare fights for the IBF uh, pretty soon, either a couple of weeks time, maybe. Yeah. So she's going to be fighting for that. And uh, should she come through that uh, with, get, win the IBF, then I would love to fight her and hopefully do a unification fight. I think that's a great option out there. Um, so is that, is that in the talks? Oh, not yet. No, obviously, like she's not got it yet. She's got to fight for it. She had it before when she fought Clarissa, and then she lost it when she fought Clarissa. Right. But right. it's become vacant, and she's going to be fighting for it again back in uh, Quebec. So yeah, all going well. She should pick that up in a couple of weeks' time. And of course, there'll be talks about unifications at some point because you know, in world champions want to have more than one belt, of course. <laughs> well, I mean, like well, the reason why I asked was in the talks because obviously, I know it's a very small world amongst boxers and box promoters and managers and things of that nature. But is there like a slight a little underhand conversation? You know, if your girl does this and my girl does this, we can basically get it on. Is that ever been like sort of thrown around, rumored around? I don't, I don't want you to spill the whole base, but I mean, like, is that is that the reason why you're mentioning it? To be, uh, no, no, no. I just know her as uh, the champion. She she had held the IBF for quite a long time and uh, is somebody that's been in the, the super welterweight division for ages. So somebody that I would, would love to fight, you know, um, she's she's going to pick up the IBF. I'm pretty certain uh, she's going to get it back. And yeah, it's a, a great champion and someone who's had many fights. So, yeah, you know, I always want to fight the best. So that's something I've been thinking about. But it's no underhand talks that I know about. Uh, maybe behind my back, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, my I don't know anything about it currently. Now, you you did mention that, you know, she should pick up the IBF strap. Um, yeah. But you know, in boxing, anything is possible. The yeah. last time we spoke about two weeks ago, there were four female British champions all holding a belt. Yeah. Now there are three. Terry Harper yeah. just lost um, last week, I believe it was. And I watched it. It was a devastating knockout. Have you, you know her, don't you? You know her. Have you spoken to her since that loss? No, I haven't. But like, I, feel, I feel really sorry for Terry because that was a very tough defense to come back to. And it, and it was a voluntary defense. And I was very surprised by the choice of opponent because... Uh, all I've ever heard about Alicia is that she's a big puncher. Uh, everyone in America said that. They're like, oh, that's a dangerous fight because uh, Alicia's a big puncher and she's got power. Um, and I was just like, well, you know, Terry's been out for maybe 15 months. She had a broken hand and, you know, she could have had maybe a, a sort of a, an easy, like she, she would have been given a bye to have like an, an eight rounder to get back in there for the first time, check out the hand, see how she's mm -hmm. feeling. But yeah. um, they decided to go down like the route of straight away a voluntary defense and taking the, the tough option. So yeah, it was a, it wasn't great to watch obviously for me because, you know, I like Terry. I think she's a really nice girl. Um, and, you know, she's worked hard to get to where she is and now she's lost both of those titles. Um, you know, people are talking about a rematch. I, I'm not so sure she should take the rematch because Alicia is a very dangerous powerful, fight. Dangerous, yeah, fight dangerous for her. fighter, and you know it's um, a hard one to come back from. So, you know, hopefully her and her team are sitting down, looking at things, and she's got some great, hopefully got some great support at home. And you know, because it is tough when you lose your titles, and especially in such a, a devastating fashion. Um, yeah, Alicia was just on fire, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's. I always talk about this, you know having been to America and spent time over there, I'm very fond of going there. 
Um, but you know, the American style is, is very different style to face up against. And yep. um, yeah, I just felt like Terry wasn't sure what to really do with Alicia. You know, it was kind of a, quite a tricky one. But uh, yeah, no, hopefully, hopefully she's recovered and she's all well. And yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to send my regards, really. Well, it's one of those things, um, yeah, I, yeah, definitely send my regards. Uh, mad shout out to Terry Harper. Hope she gets back, come back stronger and, and uh, bigger and better than ever and hope to get those titles back. But it's, it's, it's funny you mention about the uh, American style and as a pup growing up in these DC boxing gym, um, there, it was a very, there's a big difference between the US and the UK in terms of the boxing styles. Yeah. And I remember when Kell Brook lost his belt to uh, Terrence, uh, Earl Spence Jr. Yeah, and um, I was about to say Terrence Crawford, but he fought Terrence Crawford uh, uh, years later. But he, the one thing he didn't mention in his post-match interview was that the styles, styles make spice, as is a very common boxing the day. But the what the American fighters tend to do in the boxing gym is very different to what they do yeah. here. Absolutely. And you, you attest to that. Absolutely, and I think that's probably why most people say I've kind of got a bit of a hybrid style because I like the American style. I like that sort of sometimes the Philly shell, you know, setting things up like that, and it's just a different way of boxing out there. It's just very different, and um, I think as a fighter, you should want to get experience with all types of uh, styles. You know, I can imagine if I went if I was in Cuba and I was in a Cuban boxing gym, it'd be another thing entirely for me to, yeah. to look at, but. As a Unreal. fighter, I think, you know, we need to branch out of the UK. We do need to go and spy in other parts of the world because everybody has a different style. And uh, it's it's not a great feeling to be coming up against that style for the first time on fight night. <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine how to feel good, you know, and trying to work somebody out when you've only got 10, 12 rounds, when it's a brand new thing to figure out. So, yeah, um, it's different styles do make fights, but you also have to be prepared to, to fight that kind of style. Um. Speaking of styles, let's just briefly digress for a moment. Did you watch the fight on Saturday, Crawford versus Porter? Yeah. What's your take on that fight? I, I always had Crawford stopping him late. I knew this was going to happen. I am a massive, massive Porter fan. Like, uh, he's like one of my favorite guys. He's such an entertainer. He takes every single challenge, everything on board. He fights everybody never turns anything down and he always always makes it a great fight you know he pushes his opponent and you know there's exciting moments for people to get involved in so for me he's someone I look up to because for me I have the same thing you know like I want to I don't take uh, say no to any challenges I want to when I retire say that I fought everybody fought the best and uh, whatever I achieved that sort of thing and I see that in him but I knew Crawford was just going to be too smart for like in the later round I just knew he would figure him out and he'd land that shot yep. and um yeah uh, it was what I saw coming <laughs> now in terms of styles make fights obviously one thing I did notice about Terence Crawford um but I found was very intelligent about him yeah uh, in, my, in one of my recent podcasts I said that Terence Crawford really impressed me he came alive when he fought Benavidez yeah. a few years ago that to me was when he came of age all right and proved himself as an elite fighter, in my opinion. It was just the way he demonstrated himself in that fight. How he switched the styles up, he upped the levels, he adapted to the dog fight, he adapted to boxing, his movement, um, he boxed on the inside, he, he fought on the inside, he boxed on the outside, all that sort of stuff, which some fighters are afraid to do at that level. Yeah. Now, I, what I was really impressed with was when he started off, he started off as an orthodox in the, in the beginning of that fight with against Porter. He's a brilliant switch hitter, an absolutely it, brilliant switch hitter. And did you see in the second round when he realized, yeah. oh, this ain't going to work? <laughs> and he went southpaw and he stayed southpaw literally the entire fight because he said, this guy's having problems from the south sword stance. Brilliant yeah. to see. Absolutely. And that's what I've always said about Crawford is that he's got skills for days both ways. Mm, literally. 100%. Literally. <coughs> and yeah. that, so, yeah. someone asked, someone asked me in, in, in um, you know, we're, we're uh, at my gym in London, and someone asked me yesterday, what did I think of the fight and how he switched up his style? And I said, and the, and the, and the, and the guy, um, um, one of the guys here asked me, he said, can you teach that? I said, now that's what you can't teach. <coughs> yeah. You can, you can teach them how to box and you can yeah. teach them different styles, combinations. Uh, you can coach them through various scenarios. Yeah, but you can't teach that, and that's what he has, which is unteachable. Yeah, I mean, 
some people try to switch it in fights and i think it's one of those things where we're always told unless you're super if you're going to just do it to give somebody a different look and put them off their game that's fine but you then most people go back to their traditional stance yeah. but like if you can't do it successfully and super competently like that um then you probably shouldn't do it because that's when fighters get caught um mm. a great switch hitter here in the uk uh lee wood brilliant beautiful to watch okay you okay. know really beautiful to watch and same thing like crawford just it doesn't matter which way he's standing he just looks like he should be there and that's that's how it should be with a switch hitter 100 percent. and obviously in that fight uh earl Spence jr was in the crowd and got up and left right after the knockout what yeah. did you make of that when he left <sighs> I personally, if I'd been him, would not have left <laughs> because it looked bad, didn't it? It looked so bad, yeah. like so bad. And like for me, you know, if, if that's somebody that you're that people have been talking about you fighting forever and ever, you should be getting in the ring. Like you should mm. be getting in the ring and saying, let's get it on, like literally. Yeah. But he wasn't about that. And I don't know whether he thought it looked better to leave and uh, because he wasn't like impressed by it maybe that's what he was trying to show but yeah. i think as a champion uh, especially the same weight class that you there's been talking about that fight for years so like you should have been in there getting in the ring being like yo let's get it on like yeah. literally and for you i i think i already know the answer if that matchup was ever made crawford spence jr who wins that crawford <laughs> I just, I don't even know why I asked. It was a dumb question. I've said, you, I've said Crawford from the, for years, the beginning, yeah. 100%. He's one of my favorite fighters. He's one of those fighters that, because he's not massive on social media and stuff like that, he's not necessarily, I don't think, given the credit that he's due. But right. that fight there, it, like really sort of with Porter, seemed to have a lot more eyes on it than some of his other fights. Yeah. Um, and obviously he's not, he's not going to be a top rank anymore. So yeah. I think he's a, he's a free agent and that's right. I think we'll see him in some, in a much better, like a big deal and lots of fights coming up and yeah, he's just a special fighter. He's kind of like um, an old school fighter, you know, he's yeah. back. Definitely. You know, the funny thing is I just said to someone yesterday, I said, um, in funny enough in the text, right after the fight, I watched the fight. That sat, I woke up Saturday Sunday morning to watch the fight, and I said, "Man, this guy is like a throwback fighter mixed yeah. in with some new with, with some new school flavor." Yeah, you know, absolutely, he, I totally agree. That's exactly how the best way to describe him. That's absolutely, why he's so great to watch. Yeah, um, so I, I got to ask you real quickly. There's, he's a free agent now, as you know. He's left to a top rank. Yeah. Um, there's only a few big names left in the welterweight division. He even talked about possibly moving to 154. Not sure about that, but anything's possible with Crawford. But there's Danny Garcia that's left. There's uh, Keith Thurman, who he hasn't fought. Um, who, if Keith Thurman can ever get his act together. There's Ugas, yeah. which is going to fight. Uh, Ugas will probably uh, get manhandled by uh, Earl Spence Jr., in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and then there's obviously Earl Spence Jr., how do you see Crawford does do it? How do you think he does against all those guys? Start with um, Thurman. So the thing is about Keith Thurman is that he's actually a great boxer, but we just don't get to see him. Like mm. we haven't seen him in so long and he's had like little injuries, hasn't he? With the shoulders right. and stuff like that. A lot of injuries. So he's been out. So if he's coming back that, and he was coming back at sort of the level I remember him being at, that would be an epic fight. Right. And whether he can bring that out on a fight after being out for so long is questionable. Yeah. Um, I would like to see Keith Thurman and Terence Crawford. I mean, that would be good. But I still see Crawford winning. <laughs> so, yeah. And that, that, um, that, the next one is Danny Garcia. That's a good fight because Garcia's got power. So I think, you know, it won't be as clear cut with that fight. But... You never know. I think uh, Crawford's switch hitting will cause him problems. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Again, one. again, another one for Crawford for me. Last but not least, the big one, Spence Jr. I know, I you, think, said, you, see, I know you think Crawford will win, but obviously, that, to me, that goes to distance. But what do you think is the interesting tail factor in that fight? Well, I think... I think Crawford's, again, his switch hitting will be part of it. It will make it interesting. It'll be interesting to see whether he does much of it in the fight mm -hmm. because Errol Spence Jr. is like, you know, he's very smart and, he, and he's, he's a good mover. Uh, like, you know, he sets things up. He's quite clever. They're both really clever. Great ring IQ. Yeah. 
-hmm. So I think it will be a chess match early on and it'll be whoever figures out how they're going to open up in the later rounds. And I think it will be Crawford. But then again, you never know. It's a bit more of a 50-50, that one. Well, I, I think the interesting thing is because um, they could both possibly both fight from the South Pole stance. Yeah. So interesting. So for me, the exciting fight would be Josh Taylor to step up to welterweight. Now, I was going to ask you about that. Good that you beat the punch. Do you think he can actually handle that fire at 147? Yeah. Josh is massive for super lightweight. <laughs> he's so big. He's taller than me, and he's a super lightweight, right? right. Um, and he's getting to that stage in his career, I think, where he's got to go up weight, up a weight soon. Um, so, you know, he's, he's done everything at super light. Um, so, you know, he's got Jack Catterall to get through. And uh, hopefully that fight will happen in February in Scotland, I think. Um, so, of course, I will be there for that one because it'd be epic. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, I think Josh, Josh is look, eyeing a, like, a move up to the welterweight division. And him and Crawford is an exciting fight. And I think Crawford would choose to stay in a southpaw stance for that fight because it'd be southpaw v southpaw. Yes. And yeah. I, I don't see him uh, going into the orthodox because Josh, most of the opponents for Josh are orthodox and he's done that his whole life. So I think Southpaw v Southpaw gives both a little bit of an advantage. Yeah. Um, but it's, an ex it's a really exciting fight because Josh technically is brilliant. Now, speaking of fighters, I mean, obviously the, a lot of the big fights for the year are pretty much uh, passed. Um, there's Ugas Earl Spence Jr. that's coming up. Um, there's a domestic mega fight, as you know, uh, my condolences, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say condolences because no one died, but it feels like someone's career has died. I mean, do you feel for Eubanks Jr. or what? Yeah. Oh my God. Two back-to-back -back fights pulled at like, I, I feel for the guy. Well, it's not been officially confirmed, has it, that he, that Williams has pulled out? Well, BBC uh, Sport reported it that he, the fight is likely to be off. So, oh, really? I'm, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I read that um, three days ago, and it was sent to me, and I shared it with my guys in my boxing group. I feel so, uh, so bad for him. Like, so, he's such a, like, you know, he's been trying to get going, trying to get going, and they just can't get an opponent for him, and then the opponent falls out, and then, like, you know, he's meant to fight this one, and the opponent's going to fall out again. And, like, this was going to be a really exciting 50-50 yeah. fight. And, like, for me, I had Eubank winning it. But yeah. I think it's going to be a properly exciting fight. Also, on the same card as Carissa's fight. Yeah. She's defending a middleweight title. So that's her first appearance in the UK. So that'd be good. Then my friend Sam Antwi, he's fighting on there. I think that's for the British. Or he's defending as, as English. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but he's on there. And that's a great fight as well. So it's weird. I don't know. Hopefully they'll announce it soon, whether it's going to go ahead and who are they going to get Eubank uh, to fight? Because let's be honest, like, you can't just have a last minute because it won't do his career any good. Mm. Um, and he's not going to be interested. He doesn't want to fight another person brought in on a few days notice. He wants well, to fight. I, I hope I'm wrong. But the last report I read, which is only three days ago, was that the fight was likely to be called off because I think he had some injury to his hand, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, hand injuries are, are tricky. Yeah, can't overlook that. I don't think any top fighter will go into a fight with a hand injury. So that was the last report I read. I hope I'm wrong. But if, um, like you said, if, if it is on, I would definitely like to be there for that one. But yeah, I really feel for the guy. Well, yeah, I'm obviously I would definitely be there for Carissa uh, to support her because it's been ages since we've seen each other. And I just want to be there to support her for, for, for a UK debut as a pro. Yeah. Um, so that would be really exciting. But yeah. As a fan, I was excited for the Eubank fight. <laughs> like, I was really excited. Well, was I ever, but I'm also a fan for the other UK clash. I know one we've talked about before, Lyndon Arthur and Yardi 2. Yeah. What, what do you think happens in that fight? Lyndon Arthur again. Really? Yep. You think the jab would just be too much for him? Yeah, he's got one of the best jabs in the UK. <laughs> like, literally. <laughs> But what else do you think he offers behind? Obviously, the jab is, is a very fundamental punch in boxing, and we all know how great the, the jab can be to set everything up. But um, he claimed he boxed with one hand most of that fight in the, pre, in the first fight, which he won. Um, do you think Yadi does what everyone thinks he will do, impose himself early, go, go for the knockout? Do you think that? Well, that's also possible. But don't you think Yadi obviously has something to prove in this fight? I think, to be honest, like, he has to do that. 
he has to go in and try and impose himself and get a knockout early on because if if Lyndon gets into his stride and gets comfortable and he's you know he's controlling the distance with that jab and working off the back foot like he showed great discipline really really good discipline in the first fight he also has a fantastic corner so like you know yes that that whole corner there they they've got like a lot of ex- knowledge boxing knowledge and he, they led him to a good win for that fight and i think this time around yes he'll have the use of the right hand so we might see a fair, like you know obviously a different a uh, different side to it i suppose but i still think that if yard doesn't come forward and try and impose himself early on and you know push thing push the pace for him push it for his pace not not linden's pace then i think we're going to yeah, see uh, exactly the same thing that happened last time. Mm, interesting. Um, moving right along, another <laughs> British class, supposedly British class, on the heavyweight scene now. Tyson Fury is supposedly been ordered or will should be ordered by the WBC to fight um, Dillian White, which is in the balance because, of Dillian, because WBC is a bit angry that Dillian White has a so-called lawsuit. Uh, which I don't really understand because if he was a mandatory, if he's mandatory, then it should be irrespective of that. But I don't know. But what do you think happens in that fight if Dillian White fights Tyson Fury, that's, if that fight is made? I think that's a really exciting fight, actually, because uh, I'm a big fan of Dillian. I think, uh, you know, I admire, like, the t- tenacity he's had to get to where he is. He's taken, mm-hmm. like, every single fight, every hard, like... He's been given all the hard fights to get to that point, and he's mandatory. He lost it, and he got it back, yep. and he, he's mandatory again. And if anyone deserves his shot at the world title, it's Dillian White. Agreed. <laughs> 100%. Agreed. Um, Agreed. I think it, it was quite an exciting fight because Ty, when Tyson Fury came forward against Otto Wallen, when they fought that, I found that fight to be really exciting. Like, you know, because obviously Fury is really good on the back foot and he's a fantastic boxer. He's brilliant. And he can do that for that number of rounds. It's, it's so impressive for a big guy like that. But right. like when he came forward and he fought Otto, it, it made for an exciting fight. So I wonder if he'll try and push Dillian back. Um, so I, I don't know, but Dillian's got to do the work to get get to him. So... I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. I'm not sure if I've got an answer yet on it. I have to think a bit more about it, to be honest. Well, I mean, that's something that I want to lead to my next argument when it comes to the, the fan favorite, Anthony Joshua. You've probably heard that he's now traveling to the U.S. And he's looking at several U- U.S. fight uh, trainers, yeah. i.e. Um, um, he's looking at... Um, uh, well, there was Eddie Reynoso that was talked about. I'm not, I don't, I don't quite see that one happening, especially because he has Andrew Ruiz Jr. in his camp. Um, he's also looked at. Um, well, it's just, the one I found very funny was Robert Garcia when he was mentioned. Yeah. And the, the Virgil Hunter one was the only one that I felt sounded a bit okay to mm-hmm. go with, but I still don't see that happen. But the Ronnie Shields one I thought was very interesting when you looked at Ronnie Shields. What do you make of all of that? Him going, obviously he will keep his main man over here as um, the number one trainer, head trainer. What, Rob McCracken? Rob McCracken, that's what I heard. We still have him as his, his head trainer. So but, mm-hmm. it's very tricky because like, I think a lot of people are shooting him, shooting him down in flames wanting to change trainer, but it just so happens he's one of his trained trainer at a point in his career where he's been the heavyweight world champion and he unified and all that sort of stuff. and. Well, almost. And yes. uh, yeah, he, you know, he's done great things with his team, but now he's got a loss. And so he's getting vilified for wanting to change his trainer and stuff like that. But Rob also has a lot of commitments to Team GB, to the, mm-hmm. the you know, the amateurs. Yeah. And um, he's very, very busy. And I just felt in the last fight, there were way too many voices in the corner. I, I If that were me, I'd be like, what is going on? I, like, I can't listen to loads of voices all at once. No. That's why Noel is the head, the, the only person speaking in the corner whenever I'm fighting. So, yeah. um, but also, you know, he, he actually might want to just change up his style a little bit, work with somebody different. I wondered if he'd go work with Jonathan Banks. I wondered if that would be an option. As well, I, was, I was kind of surprised he didn't mention Jonathan Banks because Jonathan Banks had great success working under the tutelage of Manny Stewart for many years. Yeah. And he took over from Manny when Manny passed away, rest in peace, Manny Stewart, to work with Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah. So he obviously has experience working with heavyweights. And he's and a also, big guy himself. Yeah. Vladimir is quite upright, quite like, 
it is like, upright. Like long European style, kind of like we're here, you know. Um, mm. So, but Jonathan Banks is a brilliant coach. He trains uh, Cecilia Brackow. So um, I've been mm. over in their training camp together and I really like Jonathan Banks. And I think he's got a great mind on him as well. Like loads of mm. experience and had lots of world champions. So I feel like that would be a really good setup. But, you know, it wasn't mentioned and I was surprised. So... You never know, but definitely the Eddie Reynoso thing's not going to work if Andy Ruiz is in the camp, and also that sort of style is definitely not going to work for AJ. Uh, mm. I just don't see that working. At this stage of his career, 31 years old, um, quite a few uh, title fights, uh, not a very extensive amateur career, but in the pro game, having over 25 fights is a lot of fights in the pro game, and he's fought some big fights. Do you see the styles really? See you, chap. Do you see the styles really adding up to where it will matter to him in this stage of his career? Do you feel that a coach can add a lot to his career? A new coach? So no, I'll, I'll help yourself. So I think like, I think the fighter's got to do what the fighter feels is best for them. Mm. And at the end of the day, if mentally you feel better having somebody new and working on a few new things and just not changing your style completely, but adding to what you already have, um, then as a fighter, you've got to feel confident. And if, if you feel like it's a breath of fresh air and actually you relax a lot more and you, you can chill and, and become, you know, work on some new things. And sometimes new ideas are really refreshing and it's new things to look at. So, you know, maybe maybe that will help him and maybe a different like setting like over in America, they just train different to here. It's just right. a different way of working with their fighters. Mm -hmm. And maybe he just needs a change of scene. Cause like, it is a lot of pressure being the golden boy. Like he, he's always under scrutiny here. He's got so many um, advertising campaigns and, and things that he's like the face of. Um, he's been the face of like, he's our heavyweight champion for ages now. Um, so he's going back to being the underdog. He's going back to like being the, the challenger again. And maybe he just wants to try and do that in a different environment that will might maybe kind of fire him up a little bit, you know? Do you see him winning that rematch against Alexander Usyk? Now, I think with a different game plan, yes. Mm. The game plan that was on that night, I felt like he was in the first two rounds for the whole fight. You know, he was feeling him out for the whole fight <laughs> instead of actually yeah. just getting on with it. He tried to like, he was trying to outbox one of the best Olympic style boxers that ever, you know, technically Usyk is brilliant. So why is he trying to outbox him or like just do the same things as him? He's the bigger man. There was twice in that fight where he had Usyk hurt, but for, but he didn't step on the gas. He didn't try and take him out. He's the bigger man. Yeah. So he should be like going to work when, if he gets hold of the guy, like he's dancing around <laughs> you can get hold of him, hurt him go and I think that's what was missing it's like his normally AJ's got a great finishing instinct but that was just that didn't seem to be on show it seemed to be all about getting through the fight mm. it wasn't about winning I think I think the whole idea was to be able to get through that uh, rounds with Usyk and I think the mindset was completely wrong and even in the advertising in the lead up to the fight I was shocked by this actually they had him saying on the, one of the adverts who knows what will happen now, if you're the heavyweight champion of the world, mm. <laughs> there is no way you should be sitting there saying, I don't know what's going to happen. You should be saying, I'm going to win. I'm going to keep my titles and remain heavyweight champion of the world. Mm. So I just thought everything in the lead up to it was, was weird. And then on fight night, he didn't seem to know quite what was coming to him in the corner. And he wasn't really focused on getting rid of Usyk like, like normal, like he would be finishing him off. He was trying to kind of outbox a boxer. You just don't do that. <laughs> no. I think also, I think for me, the one thing I found was telling was at the very end of that fight, the 12th round, he looked out of it. Yeah. So he looked exhausted mentally and physically, which was a bit surprising. For some, I've never seen AJ even actually look like that. Yeah. Um, besides when he lost to Andrew Ruiz Jr., he looked discombobulated. So I wonder if these two losses, sometimes, you know what it is, a loss can take a lot out of, out of a man, especially when you're on top of the world. Yeah. Um, uh, just look at some of the great heavyweights of the past. When they've taken a couple of L's, they never really recovered. Yeah. Um, so also I want take, also mm -hmm. taking an L as a heavyweight is usually taking a knockout, <laughs> like being yes. knocked out. You know, and so taking a few of those is hard work. 
Um, I always said if I was a guy and I weighed anything above super welterweight, I wouldn't be getting in the ring. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> these guys, they've got heavy punches behind them, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's unreal. I mean, do, do you feel that... How many fights do you think AJ has left in him? I mean, I've heard all kinds of reports, and I think some of it's a bit unfair because nobody really knows the guy and, got in, and can get in his head. He's obviously made a ton of money in the sport. Yeah. He'll be rich for life. And so it's clear that money isn't his only or his real motivation at this stage because he could just call it a day and still be super nice. How many more fights do you think you, ha you, you see in him? So... I, as a heavyweight, you take a lot of punishment in the ring. Um, it's a lot of hard work, especially, and also the requirements of being heavyweight champion of the world. It's a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure on your shoulders, a, a lot of commitment. And mm. I don't think anyone would begrudge him finishing up the next two or three fights, really, uh, mm. because he's done amazingly. <laughs> as a heavyweight, he's done amazingly. He's fought some great people and because he's fought and won loads of titles now. Right. So... But I think for him, I think he wants that shot at the WBC. I think he wants that title. And for him, he won't be done till that is in his hands. <laughs> and that's what, you know, and you can't begrudge a man that because, you know, if you've had all the other ones, you just want that last one, <laughs> you know? And that could be what's driving him. I'll tell you what, if he ends his career, there, 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 there'll be some, I'm going to put it out there now. If Earl Spence Jr. doesn't fight uh, Terrence Crawford, that's going to be one of the biggest regrets in boxing. Oh, yeah. I was, I was going to say the same thing about Kel Brook and Amir Khan, which I heard they're going to fight now, but it's like six, seven years too late, and who cares now? Yeah. Um, and obviously, if Tyson Fury doesn't fight, he's already fought Deontay Wilder, so to me, Tyson Fury has proved himself. But I think if, if these guys want to be great, like in the all-time greats, to me, they have to fight each other. Yeah. Tyson's already fought Deontay three times. Yeah. He has to fight Joshua, and yeah. Joshua has to fight Wilder, and Wilder has to fight, you know, those three guys have to fight each other. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, for whatever reason, they retire, to me, they, they don't get the argument for my money to get in the all-time great list, not for my money. I think I, I, think I agree with you, um, because uh, you look back at what some of the heavyweights of the past have achieved and, and the fights they've been in. I think nowadays it's so hard to get the best versus the best, it's like when that fight, those fights do actually happen and those are made, mm -hmm. then it's a really special night of boxing uh, for all boxing fans and for the boxing world because, you know, it's just a shame for it not to happen. It's just like the biggest, it would be like a massive sort of disappointment. That's um, right. And we're, as, as fans, are, as you know, their fans are owed big fights like that. That's, That's what right. we live for, you know? That's right. So, yeah. Uh, I, I want to end this uh, this segment, this podcast, with the way we started. We talked about the female fighters in the British boxing game. There were yeah. four the last time we spoke. Now there are three. Yeah. Where does that leave you? And the other two, uh, Savannah Marshall, obviously, um, is the, uh, um, I forgot the other girl's name now. Um, Savannah Marshall's one is yourself. Chantel. Terry Harper. Sh Sh yeah, Chantel. Now, Obviously, you're all in different weight class. We're not, we're not, you and Savannah Marshall have already fought before, so that's not going to happen again. No. So where do, you, where do you plan on taking this as a British, uh, I know you're Scottish, but you're a British uh, athlete, a British boxer uh, champion. Obviously, you're, you're flying a banner for Scotland, but here in the UK, they don't celebrate you guys, especially yourself. What's next for you other than this mandatory uh, challenge, um, mandatory you got coming up, hopefully in March, as you mentioned earlier. How much, said, how many, how many more fights do you have left in? I never put a number on these things because I think anybody putting a, a number on when they want to finish, they're working towards that date, that time, like subconsciously, or whether you say you're not and be put a date and a time on it, then subconsciously you're working towards that. And are you really going to give it your all? if you're kind of almost where you put yourself finishing off. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, I don't think that's mentally a good thing to do. So for me, I'm happy right now. I'm fit, healthy, well, and um, I'm ready to take over a division. And that's my goal. I want to unify the super welterweight division. Okay. And ideally I'd love to go to welterweight and become a two-weight world champion. That's, that's my long, long, long-term goals, you know? So 
But right now, I'm going to defend my titles coming up, um, and then I will look to unify and look at the other titles where they are and who's got what and things like that. Uh, but that my goal is to unify a super welterweight division. And so Noel uh, and yourself are and your management team are looking at Scotland being the next venue or venue in Scotland to be your next place for your title defense. Yes. Uh, is that what you want or is that what's on the cards? That's what I want, of course. Buy a home in front of my family, my friends, my home, my country, my people. Yeah, no, like I'm totally biased. I've said this recently quite many times, but the Scottish crowd, there is literally nothing like it. So Terry, you better be there because you're going to be in for a treat of a night. But listen, if, if I'm not there, I'm going to put Noel in the street. He ain't going to be your coach no more. I'm going to put him in a stranglehold <laughs> because we had a mix. I was supposed to be at your last fight yeah. and he, he screwed that one up. But we, we, won't, we, won't, we won't put that on air. I've already put him on blast. I'll make sure I get the ticket for that, one, that next fight. Sure. Um, definitely been a pleasure talking to you again, sister. Uh, it's been mad love as always. Um, I'm so proud of you. And I love the fact that you got that belt, that strap on that mantelpiece right behind you, showing 